Hey everyone, I want to share this BBC clip of how the ESV Bible was put together by the committee that's going to be shown here. You're going to see various clips and camera angles. This is going to be very interesting and it's going to lead to a bigger point I want to make about something the ESV changed purely to push a false doctrine, a false narrative, give a little more, a little more teeth to pastors that other Bibles just don't really give them uh, to push this false narrative. And this is really bad, but I want you to look at the committee, the people on the committee, and tell me what they all seem to have in common that might, you know, anyway, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, but uh, let's watch this together. I'm going to try to do this and just, I'm not going to do the whole, the whole video um, from the BBC, but just going to show you certain clips of it so you get a sense. Now, let me just introduce what they're doing here. This has nothing to do with the part I want to show you they changed, but this illustrates how they came to certain conclusions, which will play a part in what I'm going to show you after this. What they're going to discuss here is changing the word slave or slavery in the Bible to something a little less abrasive, like uh, servant or bond servant purely because of the current culture we live in and how people view the term slave or slavery in America in particular. Um, even though this is not you know, just an American Bible, uh, nor necessarily is the committee Americans. So I want to start playing this. Please watch. I got a thunderstorm here. I'm in Florida, right? And I guess that season has started now. It's June, right? So <laughs> we're going to get one, one every day, I suppose. So uh, uh, there may be some background rain noise or thunder. But anyway, let's just try to do this. So I'm going to play this clip. Let's listen along. Okay than for women who are in servitude, typically shifcha and ama are your, your standard terms, and they don't all have to be handled the same way. I'm thinking of the principal male word, eved. It occurs a lot in the Bible, it's about 800 times, mm -hmm. and the majority of those we currently have as servant. But if you were to make the word slave consistent and start using it for the verb, then you, you'd end up being slaves um, before God, you'd be slaving for him and so on. So I feel the most consistent way is to put servant everywhere. If you look at the dictionaries, it's quite clear that the difference between a servant and a slave is whether they are owned by the master or whether they're paid by their employer. And right. it's quite clear. So that was a perfect distinction. I kind of paused on a weird shot here, <laughs> just his opening. But... Um, you know, one is saying, I think we should change the word slave everywhere and make it just servant, if you caught that clip, right? The next person's trying to explain the, the clear difference between what a slave is and what uh, a servant is. A slave being owned by uh, another person versus a servant who is paid by the boss, so to speak. Let's call it that. That's an imp important distinction, but you'll see in the end, that distinction doesn't matter to them because in our current culture, they want the Bible to reflect the way people think, which is dangerous to, to, to begin with. So I don't, have, I don't agree, but let's just watch a little bit more of this. In many passages in the Old Testament where it talks about Eved, that the person is owned, is regarded as part of the property of that person. Um, I think we are getting confused and reluctant to use the word slave because we think that because there is the I the word slave, that the Old Testament approves of slavery. And I think it's very much better to say that the Old Testament is trying to improve the life of slaves rather than pretending they're not slaves. Okay. Anyone want any sort of clarification from the report? Okay, then, then I would ask Jack, you want to follow up with right, something right. quickly? Uh, as an American, the term slave um, so there it is, as an American, so we're now talking about a current culture. I've heard many people say you should not interpret Bibles um, uh, based on our current culture, but what did God really mean and what was the truth in the Bible that is the inspired word of God? Not to mess with it, not to change it, but what they're debating right now is doing exactly that very thing. So how much trust do you have in the ESV when you've heard that so far? But I'm going to keep playing it, and I'm going to get to some other issue I talk about a lot on this channel, and you'll see why this group has provided the Bible that certain pastors will turn to in this one particular false narrative that I'll get to in a moment. <laughs> Hang in there with me. So we're going to let him talk. It is, is a term that, that, is, that is difficult to think of as a humanized uh, institution at all, although... Surprising, surprisingly enough, some of my African-American correspondents are less sensitive about that than I am. So that's a very interesting statement. He is saying literally the, his African-American colleagues or friends are less offended by the word slave in the Bible 
than this white guy is. <laughs> okay. We, we have a lot of that going around. A group of people who don't belong to the offended group who are getting highly offended on behalf of the other group in this woke age we live in, right? And it is really sad of how certain liberals think. I don't know if this guy's a liberal or not, but that was a very liberal viewpoint that I want to be offended even more so on, on behalf of the apparently offended group who he's admittedly saying really is not offended all right, poof, crazy, right? But it's going to get better. Let's <laughs> or make a comment about the Old Testament side of things. When we as scholars use the word slave, we have in mind something of a study of the background of slavery as it existed at the time of the Old Testament, slavery at the time of the New Testament, and we can understand nuances of it. But for the average English reader, the word slave has um, irredeemably negative associations and connotations in people's minds it's a permanent condition whereas in the old so he's saying it's different what we think about it today versus what it was meant in the old testament is what he was just beginning to say but the point still is hey let's change it because of our current culture that's what they're debating here and ultimately we'll do that by the way that's what they do certainly in the time of the new testament it's temporary it leads to a but, yeah, but you're certain no, you're and noticing it was often voluntary at least in the first century noticing a Number certain two, uh, the common the new testament, quality primarily racial, every one of these economic. people and shared third, was often a situation that had status and carried considerable legal protections and for those reasons i think we are importing highly inaccurate understandings of the meaning of the term. I think it's time for us to vote. So now they're going to go to a vote on this. Now they did change it in many places. I'll just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, so there's really no need. So he's going to call for, call, you know, hands to, to, to weigh in whether or not we want to change certain words in 1 Corinthians from slave to bond servant. But they'll do that throughout the entire Bible. They're going to literally take every instance and figure out, does it say what they really want to convey to the audience based on our understanding of today. In other words, they're debating whether or not to change scripture because people are too lazy to look at the culture of the time and actually look into what the Bible really means when they read it. And they're afraid they're going to have a lot of Christians out there that don't get the real concept of God's character or what the Bible's trying to teach us when we read the word slave or slavery and automatically apply an inappropriate view of that based on our modern American understanding or the English speaking world or whatever they were saying. So let me let me get rid of that screen and let me show you the point I wanted to to really make. So so now you understand, right? What do they all have in common? Well, it's not they don't they don't all wear glasses. Let's see. It's they're, they're not all wearing a tie. It's not that, right? Um, they're not all wearing a plaid shirt. All right. Um, let's see. They don't, they don't some have a beard, some don't. You know, what, what is it that they all have in common? Well, you can probably figure that out. Let's look at the next issue at hand here. Okay, so here you have it. I have uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and verse 34, very popular with those who would debate the role of women in the church because of what it says about women being silent in the churches. And I wanted to show you the comparison of King James Version, the NASB, and the ES, in the ESV. Um, in 1 Corinthians, let's just focus on the first one, okay? King James Version, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now, the reason why I put as in all the churches of the saints in red, not because Jesus spoke it. That's not the point. Paul wrote this. This is the inspired word of God by the Apostle Paul. Don't confuse the red letters with, with something Jesus said. I did it in red to illustrate that this is the subject text that the ESV manipulates and changes to create a new meaning. So in the King James Version, you drop down as a new paragraph and verse 34 starts. And it says, let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, obedience as also saith the law. All right. You might ask what law, right? Oh, the law of Moses, of course, right? Yeah, no, 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 a Roman law. Uh, Paul continuously told people about the law, right? 
I mean, unless he's referring to the law of grace, because he did not preach the law of Moses. He preached the law of grace. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone, not because of a set of rules set up in the Old Testament of animal sacrifices or what you did on what feast days and how you did it and the Ten Commandments and other commandments that are that were created by all these Jewish leaders and uh, f- trying their best to follow, you know, Leviticus and, uh, and Deuteronomy and so forth. I mean, Paul was the one who was liberating Christians with the realization that those things don't matter. You cannot obtain salvation by following a set of rules that are works. You need to have faith in Jesus Christ, and that is the only way by believing in him that you are saved. That's the law of grace. But that's not what he's referring to here. It was um, ancient Roman law that established the role of women in society, and it was quite oppressive. They weren't allowed to be educated in most instances. They weren't allowed to have men's jobs, right? Their their word of testimony was never permitted in a court of law. They were property of men, so on and so forth. That was Roman law. Maybe that's what he's referring to, but that's not the main point of this. Let's let's get on the real point. As in all the churches of the saints, let's see what the NASB does. Well, you can see it on the screen. Here it is. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and 34. 33, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Once again, it's in red to imply this is the subject text we want to focus on. Then it drops down and verse 34 says pretty much the same thing that we read in the King James. But here's interesting. The ESV, remember that committee of men, they made a change based on their voting on this. And what they decided was 33 really didn't... uh, didn't work the way it was written in all these other Bible versions. By the way, it's the same in King James Version, NASB, NIV, NLT. I mean, you could go to version after version after version. The only one, matter of fact, I've ever seen that changes this is the ESV. And suddenly, as in all the churches of the saints, comma, rather than the end of a sentence, end of a paragraph, now, as you can see right here, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. Well, that has a completely new meaning to the whole thing. Now, it's a universal application for the entire church age, not just the church in Corinth that was in utter chaos and paganism had made its way into the Christian church there. And Paul is writing 1 Corinthians to correct them and help them get right back on the right path. And anyway... So there it is. So now I want to show you the next thing. So what happens when you go from this kind of a change to the pulpit with it, right? You get pastors like this, John MacArthur, who's holding an ESV study Bible he's made. So he's hawking the book that he's going to sell. The MacArthur study. Does it say Bible? Yeah, it's small as can be. MacArthur's really big, though. Anyway, (laughs) now I'm just giving him a hard time, but the reality is, watch what he says here. This is a man who preaches from the NASB. Remember the NASB? There it is. Has it right, just like the King James Version. Well, let's just listen to what he's going to say about the ESV. After preaching for over like 50 years or over 40 years uh, at a point that he did another video, if I can find that, I'll show that, where he says, bar none, the best Bible version is NASB. Now, I wouldn't necessarily agree with him on that, but that's what John MacArthur said. The best Bible version is NASB, but now he's got an ESV study Bible, and he produces books through Crossway Books. Crossway Books makes the ESV. John MacArthur has books he's written that are produced are published by Crossway Books. You see the business connection? So here we go, let's see what he has to say. Hi, I'm John MacArthur. No kid. I'm really thrilled to let you know that the MacArthur Study Bible is now available with the ESV text, the English Standard Version. I am more than excited about that because I'm very much so aware horrible. of the fact that the ESV has taken the evangelical world by storm. It is the newest and the freshest and by far the best translation. It retains all the dignity and uh, beauty and magnificence of the old authorized and, uh, and yet takes into consideration the best manuscripts and is a word for word accurate representation of the original languages. Accurate word for word from the original. We just watched a clip where they're saying the original word slave is not good enough for today's culture who will misunderstand what Old Testament slavery was like compared to uh, slavery in America. 
right? Joy to be able to uh, be a part of uh, putting together the ESV with the MacArthur Study Bible Notes. Uh, passion reigns in my heart for people to understand the Scripture. Uh, it's fine to read the Bible, it's fine to be able to pick out a few things that you sort of get here and there, but it's critical since every word of God is pure and true to get the Unless you want to change it because you don't like God's pure word. Okay, so I want to show you two more things related to John MacArthur and the NASB versus the ESV and what he preaches. Now we're going to start with this. He just said, like, the best Bible version by far is the ESV, but here's what he had said before. I guess he's changed his mind, but this is what he said before. Yeah, Standard I've been Bible. using the New American Standard Bible for probably the last 40 years uh, on a daily basis in that word and comparing it with the original text in Hebrew and Greek. I believe it is the most accurate representation of the original language. It is readable. And that's an important thing. It is consistent in its language. It doesn't sound like it came out of a committee. It, it sounds like it has one author. And since the Bible does have one author, that means they've been able to capture the biblical tone uh, consistently from Genesis to Revelation. And when you spend as much time as I have in the English text, comparing it with the originals in doing Bible exposition every week, you test that text against the original day after day after day. The New American Standard has stood the test. It is the clearest, purest, word for word, formal equivalency edition in the English language. Uh, I don't think anything is its equal. Now I got one more thing I want to share from John MacArthur. This is the uh, world famous apparent uh, definitive sermon, hour and 15 minutes thereabouts, on can a woman preach so here's where we're going to start and you can see we're at the pretty much the very beginning all he did was basically introduce uh what this is about we already know the topic let's see what he starts with so to begin with let's open the word of god to first corinthians chapter 14. first remember that chart i showed first corinthians 14. i think we're gonna get a lesson from john macarthur on how to read corinthians that chapter 14. And I, I want you to look down at verse 33. Verse 33. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And then this sentence really begins the text with regard to our subject. As in all the churches of the saints, the women are to keep silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. So you see what he did there. Uh, if need be, I guess I'll, I'll show you this chart again. Okay, so remember this chart. What he did was he threw out his beloved NASB. He normally does not read from the King James Bible, which he should, right? I'm not a King James Bible only, by the way. I just happen to like it uh, and think it's the best version. Um, when I have a confusion over what a modern version says, if I'm reading NIV or NLT, which is the simplest one, but I like the NA, NASB a lot, not necessarily my favorite, but um, the, uh, the King James Bible is my favorite, by the way. Um, I'll read those, but then I will, if there's a confusion, I will cross-reference back to the King James Bible. And if there is a clear difference in meaning or word, I will say, I believe the King James Version gets it right. That's just my, my belief. And here we have, he's quoting without, he didn't say it. Now, later in the sermon, to his credit, he does mention ESV. He does say that he's, he's reading that. But in this sermon, he will read most often from the NASB, this one right here, which he said he's been reading and preaching out of for over 40 years, now over 50. But he, in this instance, chooses the ESV version. Why? Because he wants to make the claim there's a universal application to the women are to keep silent in the churches. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, I don't know if this happens elsewhere in the Bible. It might, but don't you think it's strange you have all these traditional Bibles, like the King James Bible, or, or relatively, you know, not like just made like in the last 10 years, uh, modern Bibles that have like, here's like 33 begins and it ends with a period. And then whether there's a new paragraph or not, 
34 begins a new sentence. Isn't it strange over here? I'm looking at another screen, by the way, if it, if it looks weird, but I'm not looking it this way, but um, I have two screens here. But um, here we have 33 ends with a period. There's nothing. There's a new paragraph in the ESV, and, it, and the new paragraph starts with the completion or the, the, the end half of 33, as in all the churches of the saints, then 34, in the starts in the middle of the new newly created sentence. Remember, it's, it's a not it's not a new sentence here. 34 is a new sentence. The women are to keep silent. Here it's a comma and the thought continues, but there's 34 here. That's what the ESV does. That's that's insane. And it's not to be trusted. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you that the word of God first went forth? Or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or a preacher or spiritual, let that person recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone doesn't recognize this, he is not recognized. Just from that passage alone, there's no lack of clarity with regard to what the Bible says about women who preach. Anyway, I'm not going to have you have to listen to, to more of that. I wanted to play the whole section there so people can make up their own mind. There's a lot of compelling stuff after it. So, oh, uh, did the word go, go to you? He's talking to the Corinthians now, obviously. Uh, the, the word came through the Jews first, then Gentiles. All right, that's what's being referenced there. There's so much twisting and manipulating of this. And then, you know, if anyone's a prophet or whatever that, you know, <clears throat> they don't accept this is the, 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 the word of the Lord. Once again, he's... It's not a direct relation. It's not a direct connection when you read that to what Paul's saying directly back to the women being silent in the churches. It's in reference to the rest of what he's writing. All of it would include that phrase, and it would be a commandment of the Lord spoken through the Paul through Paul to correct the church in Corinth from their uh, sadly uh, backslidden or um, deceitful ways. I mean, there was a lot going on. I mean, you got to read the whole chapter. I mean, it, it, I mean, not the whole chapter. I'm saying the whole book. I mean, all of 1 Corinthians. I mean, you have to really read this to get the proper context. And whenever you do what he did, when you take a Bible passage, and first of all, I mean, he says it's the clear word of God, but he's using a manipulated, erroneous, faulty version to make his case. And he knows the Bible better than anybody. I mean, John MacArthur knows the Bible inside and out, and not just one version, but multiple versions. No one's going to question or bring into question his, uh, his experience, his study, his scholarly ways and whatever, you know, and, and he knows this stuff. So you got to ask the question, why would he choose that version knowing so many other versions don't agree with it? Why would he choose the ESV? I'm sad to report it's one reason and one reason only. It is to manipulate the people he's speaking to and to give them a false narrative that he knows is wrong and just not just gloss over it. Like that's the word of God. So my question to John MacArthur is, is not the King James Bible the word of God? Is not the NASB the word of God? Because they are in direct contradiction to what the ESV just said. They took a, a Bible verse and they brought it down to make a universal application that the, all the other versions of the Bible do not do. So why would you not bring that up at least? Which he never does in this sermon. If you don't know, the reason why he did this sermon was because he got in a lot of hot water because he said about Beth Moore, who I don't know much about, by the way. People are always, always surprised at that. They're like, oh, you, you, you support women preachers. Go, go listen to Beth Moore. What? No, I, I, let me make it very clear. I support women who are carrying out the Great Commission. We're talking about the ones that I don't even know. They're just my sisters in Christ. I'm talking about the ones you don't know. Maybe you know someone from your church. Maybe you know someone in your community. Maybe you know a missionary. You know a woman who's doing some things. And of course, we all know celebrity names like John MacArthur, Joel Osteen, uh, Beth Moore, and other people like that, Joyce Meyer, uh, Rick Warren. We can come up with all kinds of celebrity names. Do we agree with them all? Because we're Christians and we, we want to support Christians. So suddenly we all support Joel Osteen. 
or John MacArthur. Well, he's not on the screen anymore, but anyway. Uh, yeah, of course not. That's an absurd thing to say. I support the solid, godly, born-again Christians who are women, who are conservative in thought. They're not liberals. They carry out the Great Commission because they love the Lord Jesus Christ, and they've been saved out of something like, the, like all of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and we want to go share that with other people. And that leads to things like ministry, preaching, being involved, and sometimes leadership in churches or in ministries. And to prohibit them from doing that is one thing if it's your church doctrine, if it's your denominational position. Just be honest about it and say that. This is our position. This is the way we do church. But it's not biblical. The moment you say we do it this way because the Bible tells us so, and anyone who's outside of that is an error or a disgrace or rebellious against God, that's where you become a false teacher through and through. And you gotta come, you got to bring into question anything that they say. Now, there's a lot of truth about what John MacArthur preaches a lot of the time. That's true of every con man. Now, I'm not saying he's a con man. Don't, don't, don't put those words in mind. But understand how a con man gets to the conclusion he wants those. He has to build confidence. That's where con man comes from, confidence man. They have to build confidence by telling you things you believe and you know to be true. But then they bring you to a conclusion that is false. And that's how they win. That's how they operate. A lot of truth, not so many lies. But the lies, which may only be one small one, is the main point of the whole discussion. That's what they're going for. And there's a lot of men who preach at pulpits like John MacArthur and follow his teachings on this matter who may legitimately believe what they're saying. I do not believe John MacArthur believes what he's saying by playing smoke and mirrors games with Bible versions to suit his false narrative. Can anyone honestly tell me he has not done that? Anyone who's a John MacArthur fan, anyone who doesn't like what I'm saying, please tell me where I'm wrong in my evaluation of what he just did with that Bible verse with the ESV. Do you approve of that? Oh, this Bible right here, this one, this is the NASB, by the way, doesn't say as strongly what I really want to make the point. So I'm going to put this down and I'm just going to go conveniently grab a different Bible that does give me the ammunition I need to make the point and drive it home. Do you see the error in that? How, 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 how silly that is and dangerous that is and just playing with the word of God like that? Oh, I just want to find something that fits my narrative. Which Bible version does that best? I'll go with that one. I mean, a lot of people in church do that. It's really, it's really sad. Anyway, I, I, don't, I don't think I want to say any more on this topic. I think I made the point, and I know that it will offend some people. I know people, many people don't agree with me on this position of women preachers and supporting them. All I'd like to say to you is, what did Jesus tell us to do? Think about that. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's the Great Commission. And the entire New Testament of the Bible is about the early church carrying out the Great Commission. And yes, women were involved in that too. They're written right in it. Commended by Paul. Go read Romans 16 as one example. You'll see a bunch of women listed. And already people will, will, will make comments t telling me how unbiblical I am and, 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 and how dangerous this teaching. And the Bible is clear. Well, I'm going to do a video coming up, and I want you to watch it. It's called The Three Groups that, uh, I'm not sure if I'm, the title will be exactly this, but this is what I'm, I'm going with right now. It's three groups that make real Christians look stupid. I, I, I may change that title slightly. I'm a little reluctant to use the word stupid in the title, but that's really the point I want to get at. Three groups that make real Christians look stupid. And as a side note, stifle evangelism and preaching and getting the word out to others. That's the reason why. Anyway, that's the result. Three groups. I'll do that. If you're interested in that, make sure you, you, you look for that on this channel. Uh, I'm going to do that, in, I don't know, in the coming days. Anyway, pretty soon. Probably by the time you're watching this, it's already on the channel. So go go check out the channel. Look at the list of, uh, of videos. You're going to find a lot on this topic of women preachers, a, a, a lot of different examples out of the Bible, a lot of going through the scripture, especially the one on Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3 about the qualifications of elders and deacons. I'll go through the scripture on that, explain that, because that's been maligned like crazy. Uh, matter of fact, John MacArthur is one of the people that drastically have a double standard in that one for men 
a totally different standard they they in, they they infuse into it that's not even there about women it's crazy right uh also first timothy 2 i know today's topic was more on first corinthians 14 34 33 and 34 and 35 uh but i also do videos on first timothy 2 verses 11 and 12 and actually 13 14 and 15 for that matter um so look, very exciting, controversial topics for sure. A lot of people on different sides of the fence on it, but I'm here to just illustrate the absurdity of some who make the case erroneously faulty or a smoke and mirrors like the Wizard of Oz, don't look at that man behind the curtain kind of a thing when they try to slide in their, their justification for oppressing women in our churches and in society. So with that, May the peace and love of Jesus Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. See you real soon in another video. Bye-bye.